So hello, everybody. It's really good to see you. Um, so cultural festivals, intercultural communication and ELT is a really interesting topic, which right now with the holiday season upon us is one of the most appropriate times for us to be bringing this into the classroom. It has even more relevance than it might at any other time of year for our learners. So to, to start off, I'll just give you an overview of what's going to happen today. It's really going to be a session of two halves. The first half, thinking about what is intercultural communicative competence? Um, what does growing intercultural community competence mean? What concerns do religions and cultures bring into the classroom? And then how or why do, how and why do person-centered approaches work in removing these concerns or bypassing them? Then in the second half, we'll be looking at key principles for developing intercultural communicative competence, approaches for developing ICC, and um, benefits from developing ICC. And I'll be giving you um, some, using a few examples from Sensations English Resources, um, because we, we are very much, uh, you know, cultural content, intercultural content, um, equality, diversity, and inclusion are very much part of what we do at Sensations English. And we're very thankful to be a, the winner of the British Council commendation for equality, diversity, and inclusion at the most recent British Council Awards just um, last week, as well as being a finalist in the Innovation in Learner Resources category. So, Let's get going. Um, what is intercultural communicative competence? Well, first of all, it's something that supports communication across cultures. Cultures have particular frames of reference, as I'm sure you're aware, and different cultures have different ones. And the miscommunication between uh, or across cultural boundaries can be challenging. Um, so intercultural communicative competence is something that shows that you're able to communicate across cultures. Um, it, what this, this does is it puts our assumptions a little distance away from ourselves, those cultural assumptions that we use to operate our lives every day. By developing intercultural communicative competence, you, you become a slight step removed separated from those assumptions so you're able to reflect on them a little more you're able to question their relevance a little more in different situations um question their validity um or it's it's creating something that's called intersubjectivity so it's not objective and it's not fully subjective but there's an awareness of different subjectivenesses or subjectivities from different cultural standpoints um, we use our cultural assumptions as our guiding lights and just to try and express that in a very simple way I'd like you now to think about bread okay what is the bread what what comes into your mind when you hear the word bread because for me and I'm betting that this is quite uncommon but for me it's this square horrible white unhealthy bread but for me that is bread and that will always be bread and wherever I live in the world that is what I will want eventually maybe not immediately the novelty of new places is fine um, uh, but eventually this is what I will come back to and it, it's it's widely known to be one of the most fundamental um, associations cultural associations that a person has is their concept of what bread is um, so just having a, a think about that for a second. Lots of good comments in the um, uh, chat there. I think of artisanal French bread. That sounds beautiful. And I wish I could in a way. But, um, but this is just to emphasize how even with what we think are very common or regular concepts there are so many differences and nuances to them um, so it's something for us to bear in mind and i think bread is a kind of a good um, memory aid for for that so um, thinking more about this a lack of intercultural 
communicative competence or you know a lack of awareness of what bread you might want is widely known to be responsible for business failures interpersonal misunderstandings and frustrations these are kind of often business relationships or social relationships or um, workplace relationships and those relationships can break down as a result of that business failures include things like the multi-billion pound merger of um, Rover, the British car company, and BMW many years ago, which led to an actual failure of that company um, due to a lack of intercultural communicative competence within the staff from the two countries, leading to a, a, a huge waste of money and business. And in terms of social, also this kind of lead can lead beyond that into social conflict uh, where different groups see themselves as different because of the ways in which they behave not being understood by the other group. Um, and so there's a, a great piece of research that was done years ago onto the um, Los Angeles riots and the way in which um, uh, two communities which were both marginalised ended up fighting each other rather than um, uh, or inflicting violence on one from one to the other um, rather than focusing on the people they were really angry with so um, due to the kind of the associations that were built in or uh, misunderstood due to this lack of intercultural communicative ability really so it's something that exists within communities and across communities or across cultures as well and um, uh, for our learners, learning English and speaking English in lingua franca contexts, it couldn't be more important. Um, so growing intercultural communicative competence then is um, a, a big case of questioning. At, at its heart, I feel that this is what we are able to quite easily build into our learners um, understandings or practices. And the idea of why am I thinking X, Y, Z about those people or that thing, um, uh, whether it's good or bad, why, why am I thinking what I am about it? And questioning that and seeing where those connections come from and whether there are other perspectives out there and creating some intersubjectivity. Now, we'll look at ways in which to do that a little bit later. But... Um, uh, it's really about exploring through other people's eyes. And I think expecting different perspectives and opinions to exist um, is the first part of that. And then, you know, if you're in a multilingual classroom, you've got lots of different perspectives and opinions. If you're in a monolingual or monocultural classroom, then, or, or mostly, because, you know, I don't think anywhere is quite fully um, homogenous these days, um, then you've got to find resources that will help you to bring in different perspectives and opinions. And um, uh, that leads us on to the idea of cultural festivals and religious festivals as one route for that. Um, also thinking that others' ideas are equally valid to your own, but they don't have to be yours. People can often feel threatened about um, uh, other people's views in that they might have to accept them themselves and there's no there's no need or no wish to change someone's views um, whatever they may be um, but merely to allow them to see that other people's views can be equally valid and are equally subjective to their own um, and, and obviously this can be more sensitive or more challenging in certain situations and we'll come on to that in a minute and how we can reduce the stress and reduce the problems around there. And finally, helping learners to manage and enjoy this variety that they see around them. You know, wouldn't it be dull and boring if everybody thought the same and everybody had the same ideas? It might be very convenient for someone, but um, it certainly wouldn't be very inspiring or enjoyable and and so there's a, a sense of wonder which i'll come back to later a sense of um awesomeness or um or or imagination that um that managing and enjoying this variety can can open up to learners so that's something that then creates a desire to know more and a, a desire to explore more so so that's another part of what growing intercultural communication 
com communicative competences mean? So it's not an easy thing to say. So I might stick to ICC from now on. And finally, it means being person centered. And this leads into some areas of translingual practice as well. Co-constructing understanding. If, if your perspective is different from another person's perspective, then how do you negotiate those differences? Um, where are they? about facts where are they about experience where are they about opinion or belief and where is that valid for you and also valid or not valid for another person and that space that intercultural space that you're opening up by doing that involves checking and reflecting on your own assumptions um, uh, and and indeed as teachers we're learning ourselves to do that all of the time um, in our own classroom practice too. So all of these things come together um, to, to create an awareness uh, and an ability to operate interculturally. And why should we do this? Well, not for the sake of it. You know, um, I think we're very far past doing anything for the sake of it in language learning. Um, we're developing, helping learners to develop interpersonal skills that could be just within their own culture, you know, with people who have different opinions from them in their own city, town, classroom. Also to facilitate successful intercultural contact, you know, as lingua franca English users, people who are using English as a common language to communicate in different situations in different places for for business or social or um, uh, you know personal purposes, then the light uh, and uh, educational purposes, then that's really important that those interactions are successful, so that the learner, the person, the student that can benefit from those and prosper from those situations. So it's really all about the life beyond the language classroom, rather than what we are doing within it. Um, there's also the idea that we're trying to enrich learners' abilities in language learning um, through this exposure because this is helping learners to collect, connect any language that they're learning to bigger ideas, larger schema in their minds and uh, the interactions that they're having in different contexts using English. It's also enriching translanguaging abilities, as I mentioned, talking about mediation and co-constructing meaning, um, uh, you know, in those lingua franca English contexts, students are never going to have all the information, all the language that they need, or all of the awareness of context. So it's a constant game of co-construction of balancing what you know and what you need to know and the information gap between those two things with the other people who are in that situation. And also it's helping learners to get better at expressing themselves around their beliefs because it's something that we don't touch on very much in our own classrooms usually and it leaves learners unable or unpracticed at sharing their own perspectives, their own values in a respectful and considerate way yet you know still being able to assert them and and ask to be valued themselves so there's a lot going on that we can benefit learners through this and then finally how we interact and share our connections is part of what we do as human beings in any language that we're in and it could be as part of a religious group or a cultural group or even as a subcultural group you know, people, especially young people who we are often teaching, are part of particular subcultures that where they feel their identity is based in some important way. And being able to communicate within those and then across those to other people um, helps to make those people, those people to make themselves understood. And also how we interact and share connections or how they interact and share connections as part of a global group of lingua franca English users, because in the end, this is another cross-cultural group that students who are learning English 
operate in and i'm always reminded of the kind of the international business kind of high flyers or whatever who kind of have this kind of cultural understanding within their own group as well you know the the people who up until the pandemic flew across the world a lot had um <clears throat> you know high powered jobs with lots of important meetings and all of these engagements that they they made operating in an in a intercultural cross-cultural international sphere that's much actually a much wider group of anyone who's using english to communicate um in a global setting and being able to share and be part of that group really develops much better when you've got stronger intercultural communicative competence and so these are the reasons why it's important for learners Someone said here, something basic in our lives. Yeah, definitely is. So moving on to festivals and concerns on religions and cultures. I've put these images in kind of faded or what, you know, blurred edges screens because all of these religions or cultures that we, we focus on, they have blurred porous edges, you know, they're often seen as very defined and very definite things, but that's a construction that has been given to us because not everyone who comes, who, who associates themselves with a particular religion or culture is going to share all of the facets of that religion or culture. And the way in which in classrooms we often focus on particular religions or cultures can be problematic because we can see them as artifacts we can see them as things with a set of rules and um, uh, types of building or um, uh, ways of behaving uh, which are maybe triggering to us maybe we've got personal negative experiences of that situation that cultural religion from our own lives they could be um, something that we have culturally been told is against what our culture thinks or something like that and um, they could also be something which from the bits and pieces that I know about it as a learner might be something that I feel is against the um, the ideas that I have or the preferences or the interests that I have and so they are necessarily tricky topics and because of that they are often left out of all the courses and the activities that we do yeah politics and sex Amir totally usually two no-go areas as well yeah and um and so this is where I think our common humanity comes in instead and so um, <clears throat> thinking about that and thinking about these concerns that we have when we bring these issues into the classroom is how to be respectful to different cultural customs or different religious beliefs. And we are often uncertain over the um, learners' cultural beliefs, which may clash with what we're bringing in, um, the historical and cultural backgrounds of any relationships between cultures or religions. and we might be very uncertain over particular cultural or religious practices and in in doing that be worried about making any mistakes any missteps any faux pas which would uh, cause cause offense for anyone and we've got this massive desire to be inclusive and welcoming as teachers in our safe space of the classroom and a desire to avoid any conscious or more likely unconscious bias or lecturing that we might fall into and so it feels an epic effort i've put this image there of a climber kind of who's trying using all of his effort to 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 stop himself from falling and crashing and it can feel like that um, and the level of preparation that we need can can feel too much to bring these topics into the classroom and it's a real shame because as I outlined they're great as a route to helping learners develop intercultural communicative competence so what can we do then 
taking a person-centered approach is a way for us to see the good, see the human in, and see the commonalities in, in different religious or cultural practices. Um, and so I'd like us to think about these for a second, and then I'll, I'll just show you one example to, that we can talk about from Sensations English. So person-centered approaches emphasize our common humanity. We may have specific ways of doing things, but what do they dig down into? What fundamentals do they hold onto? Um, and, and in this, for many years, I was very worried about, as I was learning more and more about teaching, improving my practice, I was very worried about language being used without values without a cultural norm or, or something like that and, and what might happen what might be allowed to happen or using english as a, a kind of value free language and, and what you know bad acts might be allowed because there was no guiding culture around it but actually when you I'm really happy that I realised that actually when you dig down, there is in all our religions and cultures, there are some very important common values that we might call human rights or we might call um, uh, morals or, or something. But they are what is similar about us and what is binding about us, in why, why we have friendships, why we value families and why we... Um, do nice things for other people um, all of that part of our common humanity that we can see in these person-centered approaches to viewing cultures and religions so in that context any particular religion or culture becomes a background for something else and we can get insights into a particular religion or culture from that background and from the the things that people do but we can also see the ordinariness of what the people are doing and so this allows us to approach sensitive customs via people themselves rather than bringing in um, uh, the, the the rules or the the kind of the idea of a particular religion or culture as a homogenous monolithic thing and through this person-centered approach we present a lived experience and that lived experience is then something that we can instantly relate to, compare to our own, connect with what we do instead, what's our lived experience. And so we focus on the ways that humans show the value of life, give meaning to life, and combine customs with their lives in whatever religious or cultural context this person-centered approach might be and news is always person-centered and sensations english news reports on religious or cultural events focus on the person because that's what news does and so it's a great way of putting that kind of distance from what we might think or know already about a particular religion or culture and bringing us closer to another person doing things like we do, but in a particular culture or religion. So just before we go on then, I'm just going to show you one of the um, reports that we did a year ago now, um, which was for the Diwali celebrations in India. And I'm going to show you the A2 level because I want to make the point that we can do this even at the lowest levels. And in my classes, even teaching beginners, I have done intercultural work with them, which has helped to build intercultural capacities, but also confidence and other things that we'll talk about later. So if you've not used any Sensations English resources, there's always a video or an audio and a transcript. Um, you can see that the transcript here is quite short um, and then there's activities and games underneath and comprehension questions but just going to watch this um, report about Diwali being affected by Covid last year.
Diwali is a religious festival, the festival of lights. This year, the festival is different. Hindus, Sikhs and Jains celebrate Diwali all over the world. They put lights outside houses. They watch fireworks. In India, it is a very important festival. Diwali happens every year, but this year there are problems. The festival had to change. In New Delhi, the air is very dirty. This year, people can't use fireworks. Temples are always full of people, but people are scared of coronavirus. They are staying at home. Lots of people in India have coronavirus, but Sonam Chowdhury thinks that everyone will still celebrate. I think everybody in their mind, uh, they are scared about coronavirus, but at the same time, they are kind of adjusting to the new normal. Uh, maintaining social distancing, sanitizing their hand and to be sane, uh, you have to get the life goes on. So in that recording there, in that story, that news report there, we had perspectives on, well, let me ask you, what did you find in there that you could use uh, to explore intercultural communication and um, explore different perspectives and a common humanity. Has anyone got any ideas that they want to share? If you just type in the chat. I can see Sylvia said she you did that at A2 and it was really Students enjoyed it a lot, yep. Yeah. Michelle, personal responses to the pandemic, yep. Yeah. Um, same, Sylvia, same problems all around the world, yep. Yeah. One thing that I really took from that was those simple little customs that we all have in really in very similar ways in lighting candles or coming together for celebrations, going to places that we see as important religiously or culturally. And then, you know, having that stopped and how we had to adapt to that. And, you know, sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional. Um, uh, we all had that last year in some way or other that we couldn't celebrate in our festivals in the same way that we normally would. And so there's a lot of um, just commonality there that we can see by the way in which we're making this person centered rather than looking at the specifics of a particular religion for its own sake. Um, Hami Halima, you've said ask learners to reflect on what they watched and link it to their culture. Yep. Um, and um, people manage to celebrate. Yes, absolutely. That's absolutely right. Um, so if we move on now to think about some key principles for developing intercultural communicative competence, no, I've managed to say it as well. Um, I think learners, we should be thinking about bringing learners into a world of wonder. You know, everything that is so common and so familiar to us has kind of lost its sense of wonder often. And the way in which people in other cultures and other religions do things which have the same significance, maybe as something that we do in our culture or religion or one that we're familiar with, um, is bringing learners into a world of wonder so that that sense of awe is is really powerful because it has a sense of something special about it and something valuable and to be respected and growing these intersubjective perspectives that i mentioned where you kind of position yourself just outside your less reflective more everyday acceptance of values and perspectives that you 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 have grown with and you exist within so um it's someone um i read a book very many years ago i can't remember it now but it talked about a kind of triangulation and if you you kind of like you've got your culture another culture and maybe a third culture and rather than you being 
in that triangular point. You're just inside that triangle that's being there. So you've got a slightly abstracted perspective or intersubjective perspective on things. And it's all about discovering, understanding and sharing, being open to be discovering, growing an understanding and communicating that and sharing that understanding and your own cultural or religious perspectives with others in respectful and you know respectful ways and connected with that sense of wonder that what everybody is saying is valuable and it's about building connections between people or peoples you know and groups and and by building connections i mean um for connections in understandings um as well as connections physically between people and groups which you know within a classroom we might be able to do but and um, certainly when we're out in the world we might be interested in doing but we might not as well it might just be our own personal understanding that then is something we can keep for ourselves and use as a benefit in our own interactions and it's also about building those understandings and, and connections across cultures and beliefs so that rather importantly we don't feel intimidated or our learners don't feel intimidated by uh, an other uh, a different belief or a different culture so that we are able to enjoy those experiences using that sense of wonder that desire to discover understand and share and also it's one of the key principles is valuing existential competencies and um, uh, this is one of the six savoirs that are mentioned in um, the uh, CEFR savoir être or the the how to exist you know how to be um, and and within that um, it's really about building a pluricultural repertoire your ability to do those things of building connections across across cultures and mediating cross-cultural communication but it's about valuing those capacities as part of what we are learning as lingua franca english students or learners um sorry i, I kind of feel myself always a learner in the classroom as well so if i say we and i mean learners well i think we all are really still um Ana Maria Lopez how difficult is that you say well this is the thing I think it looks a lot more difficult than it is because we're really just tapping into using the right resources taking the right taking a a, a person-centered approach um we're we're tapping into or connecting with all of those things about people which are interesting and valued and we're seeking to value ourselves or have our learners value themselves as well as the other people in their class so it's you know really about those fundamental commonalities about humanity so it's, i think it's something easy to tap into as long as we don't go into the areas of this is x religion or x culture and this is what they think because you're you're kind of not just othering there but you're saying you're 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 kind of pushing away the similarities and focusing on the, you know, a kind of a homogenous block of ideas which seem more impenetrable or that we have to bend to um, as individuals. And, and, and that's the opposite of the person-centered approach, if you like. So approaches for developing intercultural community of competence. <laughs> as I was just saying, using people as the starting point and using otherness as a human quality rather than a, uh, a totemic or a, um, a um, overbearing uh, feature of a particular culture or religion. So you and I are different. There is an otherness between us and finding out and learning about that otherness is the interesting or the um, enticing thing. So using people and a person-centered approach is the starting point. Um, and then we've got sharing learners' own perspectives. This is the other bit that maybe Anna, I, sh I should have mentioned a second ago when you asked, um, 
getting learners to bring what they know and see into the classroom and using them as the resource so you're really facilitating um, managing the in engagements um, uh, between different ideas different opinions on a particular area or topic and encouraging learners to notice differences in others impressions and this image here with all the the bubbles um, they all came from the same source but they're all individual they've all got particular qualities of size and weight and color to them as they pass through the light and all of these things um, uh, but they are all bubbles so um, uh, there's there's this, the, the fundamental similarities and then the interesting otherness of particular humans and um, that as a quality of variety and humanity um, using a lot of small group tasks setting these small group tasks because that gives space for learners to share opinions and listen to each other um, which is a vital part of this um, you can also manage large group discussions if you are modeling or building this for the first time you might um, uh, organize this and, and, and model it as an activity and I've got one activity to show you in a minute um, but small group tasks then help first of all they help people to communicate in a bit more depth about their own personal perspectives um, there's a little bit less stress in communicating these kinds of ideas in a small group than in a big you know whole class context where you might either and a particular learner might either get very shy or very defensive um, and, and communication might break down um, so small groups definitely work for those reasons but also then small groups have the chance to interact with each other more and question and explore dig deeper into these ideas too and what we're really asking is you know the intercultural element is exploring the commonalities where there are similar actions across festivals or similar meanings across festivals and i think festivals are such a good tool for this because they have such similarities to them and we can all associate with doing festivals and enjoying them and finally valuing accepting and being open to difference so all of this that we've been talking about here emphasizing from the start that all the students in the class think differently about particular things they might have some shared beliefs or perspectives that, but they will definitely have some others which are different even if it's whether they like cheese or not or or whether they enjoy a particular activity or not so it doesn't mean that the, the other activity or the other food is wrong so there's valuing accepting and being open to the the differences between people and, and the fact that they are still valued for whatever their choices or preferences are as much as someone else is valued who is different from them so um i'm going to show you one activity now that um uh I've just seen, seen a really interesting point here. Yes, it's not easy to understand intercultural communicative competence, especially at the beginning, completely agree. Um, and, and this journey for me, I'm trying to kind of boil all of this down for you. This journey for me has been years long and it's, it's really interesting to see. And one of the first activities I did, which still gave me so much insight, um, uh, is inspired by Tomlin and Stempelski. Um, uh, it, but quite changed um, uh, something called the culture wheel and you can see there's a wheel on the screen with four different quadrants to it um, with people food work and free time and I've just given them numbers because the idea was to spin a kind of a, a spinner whatever and you might not have that in your classroom so just numbering them makes it easier you can use a dice but the idea is learners take turns to share ideas um, and, and this provides the structure for it and it's their own ideas or perspectives on a cultural event or a cultural area um, uh, you know it could be habits at Christmas um, and at Eid 
for example, or it could be habits in Britain and in your country. Um, and by the, the way in which we approach this, if you did this, everybody speaking at the same time, it would be a free for all. Whoever was the loudest voice would speak most um, and it would be a bit chaotic. So there's a procedure to follow with this. Um, you choose who's going first and the first learner spins the wheel or throws the dice to choose the topic. They cannot choose it for themselves. They, they, they might land on what they want to talk about, they might land on something else. And then the learner shares their perspectives on the similarities and differences um, uh, between, say, work at Christmas and at Eid. Um, if they're and it doesn't matter whether they're from one culture or the other culture or a third culture, because these perspectives are going to be whatever they understand. And the student can talk for as much along or as little time as they want on those things. Um, during the time when the learner is speaking, the other learners can listen, but they can't comment on what the person has said, because it's it's really valuable that that person's perspective is heard and isn't contradicted. You know, there is, there is no one correct answer on this. We are taking a person-centered approach and our person-centered perspectives on any particular um, uh, situation or part of life are our own, um, informed by our experiences and um, our own cultural position or context. But then, the learners can, the other learners can ask extra questions to find out more, to dig into that person's understanding. So what, for example, if you think um, uh, everybody at, during Christmas, everybody um, uh, doesn't work for two weeks and, um, uh, you know, you can ask, what do they do in that time? How do businesses carry on or whatever? And they say, oh, well, no one wants to go anywhere or anything. Other shops are all closed or whatever. Now, you know, from my experience of Christmas in the UK, that's entirely not correct, but that doesn't matter if we're building up this idea that I'm sharing my perspectives and understanding and giving them to other people to understand. And then other people are giving me theirs as well. And our learners are therefore the resource. So after that has happened, then another learner takes a turn chooses a topic by spinning the wheel or throwing a dice and speaking about it on the same topic. So for example, habits at Christmas and at Eid. Um, and then after all the learners have spoken, and gone through that process, the group discusses anything surprising to them. It's not a question of whether something is true or false, but whether something was surprising or not. Um, whether something is, you know, it was interesting for them to learn about something or they hadn't heard about this or it wasn't the same as their experience or whatever it is. But using that approach, using those perspectives to, to deal with that. And as a result of that, you have really built value and um, respect for different people's opinions, different um, ways in which people um, celebrate or do particular action um, do particular activities or show value for something a particular you know value for life or value for um, uh, you know um, important things in their culture or religion and and see the commonalities between either those actions or those ideas um, and the way in which other people have different perspectives on them so all of that is helping you to then reflect on your own perspectives and they become slightly less rigid and slightly less um, uh, restricting. They're still yours and they're still yours to use to develop your own life and manage your own interactions with people, but they, they acquire a, a flexibility, um, which is um, really what we're asking the students to do to, to to accept that there are different perspectives and to feel comfortable with that. Because the biggest thing is that having different perspectives can feel really uncomfortable. So, so that's, that's one of the things. Um, uh, so that's the culture wheel. That's just an I idea that I found really useful. And at really, really, really low levels, you know, when learners are very unable to express much, 
you can even do this without the binary just focusing on one thing like um you know different cultures perspectives on british people for example which is hilarious you will hear all sorts of different things from people they're either we're either really hard working or we're really lazy or um uh we we work all the more in the afternoon or we get up early all of these different things and it, it's amazing to see students at such a low level of english ability um productive ability communicating these things and realizing that hey, they have very different perspectives on um something that seems so homogenous and so um uh, totemic as britain and the red telephone boxes and all of that so the benefits from developing intercultural communicative competency is the co-construction of situated understandings students become more relaxed about the differences that they notice more open to differences in opinions and they are more developing in their translingual practices abilities to mediate understanding and work collaboratively uh, across cultural differences and this image here is actually from another of our uh, reports which I, I won't have time to show you today but which is about a buddhist monk who during lockdown um, did beatboxing and and put mantras Buddhist mantras to um, beatbox tracks and um, he you know prior to being a monk he was a beatboxer and and that's kind of a mixing together of these different things that he valued and communicating uh, a, a very important feature of his life his his religious beliefs to others through um, a new medium so that's just one of those ideas check that one out it's called beatboxing buddhist monk um and um so you know this is part of us helping learners to mix together their ideas with other people's ideas um to to give them a better ability to negotiate the world um and yeah being able to share more of themselves as well to offer their own personal perspectives and feel more confident with doing that to find connections between cultures and people you know they might be someone who's actually able to you know bring people together in a workplace or help to resolve conflicts in a in a classroom situation when they're at university or something like that because they see more the differences between um people being uh, subjective and um, surface level and um, context specific and opening up people to seeing those connections between those contexts or those cultures and finally it it makes them more able to give intersubjective assessments of situations which they are in so that that kind of um culturally bound way of seeing a situation um, might be limiting their ability to take advantage of it or e even their ability to see issues with it and um, and so the intersubjective assessments is really another tool for life that learners are receiving um, uh, a bit, some development in through dealing with intercultural communicative competence um, oh, I was just going to show you one more piece, and I think with all of this said, um, had I shown you this at the start, I think you might have found this a little bit much, but um, this is um, a really interesting story that incorporates so much which we might see as problematic um, about differences between religions and about issues across um, uh, politics and culture. But again, I'm going to show you just the A2 level to show how useful this can be. But this is about um, uh, Hanukkah being celebrated in Dubai. <laughs> Hanukkah is a famous holiday. It is the Jewish festival of light. These people are in the United Arab Emirates. This is the UAE's first public Hanukkah. This year, the UAE and Israel made some new rules. The two countries now work together. Hanukkah is about good things. Rabbi Mark Schneier is American. 
He thanks God for this situation. And celebrating Hanukkah here in Dubai 2020, I have to salute God's miracle workers who are greatly responsible for making this modern day miracle happen. Gil Gurevich is from Israel. He wants a good future for everyone. It's a dream come true, and it's a miracle, and this is Hanukkah. It's to light the candle that will be light. It says or in Hebrew, and this is what just happened. It's made or, and I hope this peace, inshallah, will bring uh, all the Israeli here, all the humans there. And... Gurevich reserved 50 rooms in a Dubai hotel. The restaurant food is kosher. Jewish people can visit the hotel on the Sabbath. This is when people rest and pray. Gurevich put the mezuzah outside each room. Jewish homes have a mezuzah next to the door. Rabbi Schneier is happy. Israel and the UAE are now friends. It has tremendous meaning and significance to actually participate, to witness, to experience the miracle of Gulf-Israel relations and the exponential growth of Jewish life here in Dubai. And so just thinking about that from the perspective of what we've just spoken about, you, you see a particular culture, um, there's all sorts of issues around it, but you see something positive, and within that you see all these small little habits or customs which and, and beliefs that people have, which are common to any particular culture or any particular religion, a use of light to represent hope, um, things like the mezuzah going on the door, you know, what that's something that's culturally specific, what ways do we have in our culture or our religion of representing those same things how do we interact with religious issues um, in other countries or you know do we have any minorities in our country who are who can or can't celebrate all of these different things which can bring up some you know they could be quite troubling you know some people could have some quite strong or defensive views but through then asking people to share those views you get a an a a kind of a mixing of perspectives and um, a, a way in which people can access the idea that yeah you're going to meet people from all sorts of different cultures who have got all sorts of different things which are you know beyond that person about the issues you know these people couldn't celebrate before because of politics and religious histories and all of these different things but you can bring this story about some people being able to now celebrate their religion in a particular country um, uh, and and that being something that you would like as a right for your own particular beliefs wherever you go as well and that could cross all sorts of different areas so so that's just um, one thing there the image I've got here on this last page um, is of Rio Carnival in um, in in Brazil and again that's wrapped up in a whole different set of values and beliefs about culture and art and freedom of expression and the, the story there in particular was about the, the politicians in um, Rio trying to not pay for Rio Carnival because they didn't like some of what they stood for so there's lots of different ways in which what we focus on as individuals or as people, it's got a background of something bigger that could be problematic. But if we focus on the people um, and we bring the otherness towards us rather than away from us, then it opens up a lot of space for us to help learners develop these intercultural communicative competencies. So, um, Yes, everything I want to say. Has anyone got any questions? This recording will be available, yes. Yeah, um, I can see three questions in the Q&A box. Um, 
does ICC differ from pragmatics, please? It's a really interesting question because pragmatics in terms of linguistics is what an utterance actually means rather than what it might logically or semantically mean. So there is a sense in which everything that's done culturally has a pragmatic element, an element of pragmatics to it. Um, so, I mean, I think they're very good partners, but I don't think that they're particularly, um, I don't think you could say that they are the same thing. I think one might give useful perspectives on, on the other. Um, Amir, if that answers your question, if not, shout in the chat. Um, yeah, that's the only real question that we've got here. Um, it's exactly three o'clock. So um, I just want to say if you've got any questions, you can always email teaching at sensationsenglish.com. Uh, go to the website to check out all the different activities. And just to say that um, uh, you can find more useful ELT webinars at our webinars for teachers site, sensationsenglishwebinars.co.uk. Um, and please do sign up for the Sensations English Teachers Edition, which has got all of the um, resources that you've seen there. And also it comes with logins for your students so that your students can use all of this as well. I'm gonna pop this into the chat along with our social links so that you can, you can access them. Um, and um, uh, please follow us on social media. Um, we're always putting out new posts about our latest stories and we're really, really delighted that we've been announced as the winners of two commendations at the British Council Elton Awards last week. Um, the Award for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion um, and we are the first and only winner of the inaugural commendation for environmental sustainability and climate action and if you want more information on how to use climate um, issues in your classroom to benefit your learners. Our previous monthly webinar was, is on our Webinars for Teachers website, uh, along with lots of resources for you to access as well. So um, thank you very much for coming today. I can see a couple more notes in the chat, so I'm just going to scroll down. Thanks, thanks. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, new, more sessions about intercultural community competence. We'll see what we can do. Um, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it just remains for me to say thank you for coming today. Good luck with your teaching and please get in touch if you need any support or help. And um, uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar in January. And uh, have a lovely holiday period and new year. And um, uh, yeah, be well and um, uh, enjoy whatever ways you're celebrating. Bye-bye.